Question one in the right-hand section. Let's read the sentence. Interestingly, a 2017 ecological study led by Dr. Eva Knopp suggests that artificial lighting, the modern convenience that illuminates many streets, storefronts, and athletic fields, may be contributing to the decline of these organisms. So you can really just focus on this part, which is the indirect quote. They're suggesting that artificial lighting, and this whole thing is a modifier, the modern convenience that illuminates many streets, storefronts, and athletic fields, because this is really the subject, lighting, and the main verb of this subclause is here. But for this particular question, we're focusing on this verb, illuminates, and what is the subject of this verb? It's actually convenience, which is singular. So that's going to help us find the answer. It's the modern convenience that illuminates many streets. That sounds okay. Let's look at how they want us to fix it. The modern convenience that illuminate. So this would be wrong because it needs to be plural. B would work if it said one of the modern conveniences, plural, that illuminate. So B is plural and that means C and D are, this, are wrong for the same reasons. Plural are and plural have. That means the best answer is A. Question two, the sentence starts over here. Daytime pollinators, such as bees and butterflies, have many well-documented threats. So Dr. Knopf's team sought to investigate a potential threat to nocturnal pollinators, artificial light. We can really focus on this part of the sentence it's a, since it's an independent clause. So let's look at what's going on. They're using a semicolon between pollinators and artificial light. This is an incorrect use of a semicolon. Semicolons are used to separate two um, independent clauses, two you know, sentences that are very closely related, and some people say they should have equal grammatical weight. So we'll cross off A for that reason. Choice B, they change it to a colon. Choice B does actually work because this is a proper use of a colon. The book that I always recommend for grammar is this one. It's called the uh, Scott Forsman Handbook for Writers. And if you look on page 542 in the ninth edition, one of the usages for colons is you're directing readers to examples, explanations, or significant words or phrases. So you're at, in your mind, you're saying, well, what is that threat? It's revealed to be artificial light. So in this sense, I like to think of a colon as anticipation is building. And then with the colon, the curtains are kind of opening and you're revealing whatever the idea is. So B will keep. Notice in choices C and D, they're kind of similar. The problem is when you take away the punctuation or if you use a comma, it's not clear what the relationship is between the nocturnal pollinators and the artificial light. Or you could even read it as a list. They sought to investigate a potential threat to nocturnal pollinators and a threat to artificial light. So all in all, that means the relationship is just not clear. And in this particular case, where the artificial light is the actual threat, the use of a colon is warranted. So B is going to be the best answer. Question three, we can start right over here. Before the plants flowering began, some of the plants were covered with mesh bags to outlaw visits from pollinators. And we'll stop there. So immediately when you're reading this, you should realize that outlaw is not a good word choice. And so this is going to be a diction problem. Diction means word choice. Outlaw specifically means to make something illegal. Obviously, that's not what's going on here. Glancing at the answers, you should immediately zoom in to the word prevent. What we're saying is basically we want to stop the visits from the pollinators. And in order to do that, we're covering them with mesh bags. Prevent is the most neutral word. Looking at the other choices, choice B, oppose generally means to go against. Like you can oppose somebody's opinion or you can oppose a law. Revoke is usually means to take something away, like you can revoke someone's privileges or revoke someone's license. Either way, not appropriate words to be used here. And again, in diction problems, you kind of just have to know how the words are used. If you don't know the words, then the best thing you can do is just take a guess. Question three, we can start right over here. Before the plants flowering began, some of the plants were covered with mesh bags to prevent visits from pollinators. However, others were left unbagged. So what you should notice automatically is that we have a comma splice. That's two independent clauses, two complete sentences connected by a comma. In other words, when you start something with however in this way, this sentence is independent. It stands by itself. One way to fix this would be to turn this comma into a semicolon, but they don't give us that option here. So let's see what else they do. 
choice B, they were going to outlaw or they were going to prevent visits from pollinators while others were left unbagged. That actually works because if you change the word however to while, it makes this part a subordinate clause and it can connect to the main clause before. So technically while is functioning as a subordinate conjunction, but the most important part for you guys to remember is that it changes this whole phrase over here into a dependent clause. So B is going to work. Choice C is actually the same problem as A in that it's a comma splice. If you start this part by saying, meanwhile, others were left unbagged, that's a complete sentence. So that's not going to work. Choice D, they were going to cover the mesh bags to prevent visits from pollinators so that others were left unbagged. So choice D changes the definition. Instead of offering a contrast that some were bagged and some were unbagged, choice D is making it sound like they covered some in order to have others uncovered. So that's clearly changing the meaning and that's going to be wrong as well. Question five, it says the writer wants to add the following sentence to this paragraph. Half the plants in each category were illuminated during the nighttime hours. The best placement for the sentence is... So notice what they're talking about. They're making a subdivision. They're saying half the plants in each category were illuminated during the nighttime hours. The best place for this is going to be right after you talk about the two categories. So let's look back at the passage. So if you quickly scan the uh, paragraph, you'll realize that the two categories are introduced in sentence three, which we just read. What are the categories? Some of the plants were covered with mesh bags. That's one category, while others were left unbagged. So right after you're introducing the two categories of bagged versus unbagged, then it would be appropriate to mention what you're doing in each of those categories. Half of the plants in each were then illuminated during the nighttime hours. So the best answer is going to be C. Question six, it says, which choice most effectively combines the sentences at the underlying portion? So let's read it. The bag plants couldn't be visited by pollinators because of that fact. The bag plants self-fertilize, blah, blah, blah. So clearly we have a cause and effect relationship because they couldn't be visited by pollinators. They ended up self-fertilizing. So let's look at the answer choices. Choice A, the bag plants couldn't be visited by pollinators, so the lack of pollinators meant they. So one thing on the SAT you want to keep in mind is that you want to avoid repeating words and phrases. Here it says they couldn't be visited, visited by pollinators, so the lack of pollinators. Stylistically, that's probably not going to be a good choice, so we'll sort of cross it off. Let's jump down to choice C. It says the pollinators couldn't visit the bagged plants and those plants, so we see the same kind of stylistic mistake here. We're repeating the word plants. Choice B and D, let's look at together because they're very similar. Choice B says, being that they were unable to be visited by pollinators, the bag plants, therefore, now compare that to choice D. It says, because they couldn't be visited by pollinators, the bag plants. So what are the main differences? Number one, B says being that, which obviously you guys know is kind of a stand-in for because. And the other difference is the word therefore here and no therefore here. Being that is never really a good choice because it makes the relationship unclear. If you want to show that this is cause and effect, because is going to be a much better choice. And also in terms of redundancy, being that is written here to signify cause and they're also using the word therefore, you can argue that that's kind of redundant. Notice that in choice D, because you're using the word because, you don't need the word therefore. So choice D overall is going to be better. Question seven, which choice provides accurate information from the graph? So let's read the sentence that's underlined. Let's start with our correct choice from question six. Because they couldn't be visited by pollinators, the bag plants self-fertilized and thus averaged only about 15 fruits per plant in dark sites, but 85 fruits per plant in illuminated sites. So keep in mind, we're talking about the bagged plants, 15 in the dark sites, 85 in the illuminated sites. Is that true? Let's look at the graph. So for the bagged plants, what we see is that in the dark sites, it looks like about 15, a little bit under, in the light sites, a little bit over 15. So about the same. That means that the original is not true because it says 15 versus 85. Choice B says the bagged plants 
averaged 15 fruits per plant, whether they were in dark or light sites or illuminated sites. So that's definitely true from what we just looked at. Choice C, 20 fruits per plant in dark, but 80 in the light. So that's about the same as the original, except they changed 15 to 20, so that's not right. Choice D, 100 fr fruits per plant, whether they were in dark or illuminated sites. Also not true because we just said that they were both about 15. So B is going to be the answer. Question 8, which choice most accurately represents the information in the graph? So very similar to number 7. Let's read the sentence. On the other hand, unbagged plants from the dark sites produce an average of 90 fruits per plant, whereas bagged plants that were exposed to artificial light produce an average of 78 fruits per plant, a 13% decline. So given that they want us to change the underlying portion, the easiest way to do this is look on the graph for which bar was around 78. So clearly the one that's at 78 is right over here. These are the unbagged plants that were exposed to the light. So that's the answer that we're going to be looking for. And automatically that gets us right to choice C, the unbagged plants from illuminated sites. Let's quickly look at the other ones. The original says bag plants that were exposed to light. That's over here, and that was number 15. So that's not 78, A is out. Choice B, bag plants from the dark sites. We know that that was very similar, and so that's also around 15. So B is out. Choice D, unbag plants that were not exposed to artificial light. That was right over here, and they were around 90. Also doesn't make sense because that's what we're comparing it to in the sentence. So choice C is going to be the best one. Question 9, which choice provides the best transition to the paragraph that follows? So on the SAT, when we're talking about transitions, you really need to pick something that very obviously connects to either the next sentence in the next paragraph or the topic of the next paragraph. The previous paragraph says that the research showed that nocturnal pollinators were avoiding the unbagged plants in the illuminated sites. That makes sense because the illuminated sites were about 78 right over here, which affected the overall yield of the plants. Now, what is the topic in the next paragraph? Let's look at it very quickly. It says the scientists also found that the decline in nighttime pollination visits coincided with a decline in visits from daytime pollinators. The precise cause for this dual decline was unclear. And then they talk about the dual decline. So basically both the nighttime and the daytime pollinators were decreased. So we need an answer choice that connects to that idea. So the original choice which affected the overall yield of the plants kind of implies it, but there's probably going to be a better answer. Let's keep reading. Choice B, they were avoiding the unbagged plants in the illuminated sites, but these pollinators were regularly visiting the unbagged plants in the dark sites. That almost implies that there was not a dual decline in both because it sounds like while they were decreased in the illuminated sites, it might have been the same or increased in the dark sites. So B goes against the idea of the dual decline. Choice C, although the researchers hope to investigate the result further, choice C is really just not connected in any way to the next paragraph. So not going to work. It's actually worse than choice A. Choice D, and daytime pollinators were not making up for the loss. So this one works because to say that there is a decrease in the nocturnal pollinators in the illuminated sites and there was no makeup for that for the daytime pollinators basically says that there was a dual decline that both were going down so choice d is going to work and that's the answer question 10 the scientists also found that the decline in nighttime pollination visits coincided with a decline in visits from daytime pollinators so this sounds okay to me let's look at what they propose choice b the decline here coexisted to a decline in daytime pollination. What you'll notice is that if you glance through all the answer choices, these words coexisted, correspond, correlated, they're generally okay, although coexisted is questionable. But what makes these answer choices wrong is that the preposition that they match up the words with is incorrect. So generally you would say coexisted with, you would say corresponded to, or even maybe corresponded with, and you would say correlated with. 
So that's actually what makes choices B, C, and D wrong, and so we're forced to continue with A. Question 11, let's start reading right over here. It says, whatever the reason, artificial illumination clearly has adverse effects on plant pollination, and the increasing presence of artificial lighting may pose a major problem for biodiversity. Clearly, this is not the right choice of the word present. Present here with a T means that it's a gift. So clearly, the artificial lighting is not giving a gift. We obviously want presence um, with a CE because that basically means that something is present, something is there, it's not absent. And then the only question is, is it the increase in presence of artificial lighting or presence in artificial lighting? It says the presence of the artificial lighting poses a major problem. So the artificial lighting itself is the thing that is present, which basically means that C is the better answer. If you were to say presence in, then you can make up a sentence that said, you know, we were present in a room with artificial lighting, but then the subject of presence would not be the artificial lighting itself. It would be something else. So that's what makes D wrong. Question 12, let's start reading right over here. It says, the decision allowing employees to customize their previously uniform looks with such accessories as hats and colorful socks reflects workplaces across the United States. So the first thing you want to notice is that we can basically ignore everything in between the dashes. And if this is a subject verb agreement question, the subject of the verb reflex is actually decision, which matches well because they're both third person singular. Let's look at the answer choices. What you'll notice is that B, C, and D all change workplaces into trends. So the question is, does the decision reflect the workplaces across the country? Or does the decision reflect the trend of allowing its employees to dress more casually? I'm going to argue that the decision reflecting the trend is actually more precise language as opposed to a specific decision representing the actual workplaces. So we'll cross off A. Now what you'll notice is that B is the simplest. The decision reflects a new trend in workplaces. C and D are actually going to be redundant because notice what choice C does. It says, it reflects a new trend or tendency. So they're basically explaining what a trend is. Not really necessary, it's just redundant language, as we said. Choice D is reflective of a new national trend in workplaces across the United States. Is it necessary to say national? No, because we're already talking about the US as our context. So this is also gonna be redundant and B is gonna be the best answer. Question 13, let's start reading right over here. From retail services to large corporate offices, employers are finding that flexible dress codes can make a company more attractive to potential workers, boosting morale among current employees. So what you'll notice is we have the same problem here again. We've got a semicolon, but the part of it after the semicolon is just a fragment. It's not a complete sentence. You could probably just change it into a comma which would make this part of the sentence a participle and it would make sense. Let's see what they have. B, it can make a company more attractive to potential workers. Additionally, they can boost morale. This you'll notice is a comma splice because if you start the next part of the sentence with additionally and then they can boost morale, that's an independent clause or a complete sentence by itself. You'd need some type of conjunction so that doesn't work. Notice what choice C does, it puts a period after workers, so the sentence ends right here, but then you're left with a fragment. And boosting morale among current employees, not a complete sentence, so that doesn't work. Choice D, if you say that it can make a company more attractive to potential workers and boost morale among current employees, what you're doing is you're using two verbs. Notice that the relationship between the boosting morale in the sentence is clearer because they're basically saying flexible dress codes can do two things. One, makes a company more attractive, and two, boosts morale. So 13 is choice D, and we'll go with that. Question 14, we can start reading right over here. It says, also being able to personalize otherwise identical uniforms with unique flourishes can enhance happiness by allowing them to retain a greater sense of personal identity in the workplace. So when you're reading this, you should be saying in your mind, well, who is them? The only people mentioned in the whole paragraph are job applicants, but that's way too far away from the sentence. So this is basically an ambiguous pronoun. Not likely going to be the answer. 
choice B, it allows him or her, again, same problem as choice A, who is him, who is her. Choice C seems to solve this problem because they're saying it can allow employees to keep a greater sense of personal identity, so that works. Choice D is interesting because what it does is it says the flourishes, which is kind of like the details or the enhancements, they can actually enhance happiness by allowing the flourishes themselves to retain a greater sense of personal identity. But obviously, you know, when you're reading the sentence, it's not the decorations or the details that have a sense of personal identity, it's the people who are actually doing them. So D is going to be out and C is the best answer. Question 15, let's start reading from here. Individuals' motives may vary, but job recruiters are finding that many potential employees do indeed share a preference for flexible address codes. And we can stop there. So looking at the answers, we know this is going to be about apostrophes and S's. We know from reading that the motives, the motivation belongs to the individuals. So we definitely need an apostrophe on the individuals. So we're going to cross off choice D because it's not like the individuals belong to the motives. The next question is, are we talking about one individual or multiple individuals? Most likely we're talking about multiple because we're talking about job applicants. So that means the apostrophe has to be after the S for multiple individuals. We'll cross off choice C. Choice C would make sense if we were talking about a single individual or an individual's motives for doing something, but that doesn't work here. Notice what choice B is doing. It's saying individual's motives. It's almost acting as if individual is an, a positive describing motives. If you wanted to go with that idea, you can remove the S and then say individual motives may vary. And in that case, individual would be kind of acting like an adjective describing the types of motives. That would work, but only if it didn't have an S. So we'll cross off choice B and we're only left with choice A, and that's gonna be the answer. Question 16, it says, the writer wants to set up the information that follows in the sentence with an accurate interpretation of the data from the table. Which choice best accomplishes this goal? So let's read it. Start over here, it says, according to a 2016 study, essentially none of those surveyed wanted to be employed by a company with a relaxed dress code. 31% of respondents reported that they would prefer a company with a business casual dress code, and a further 27% reported that they would prefer a casual dress code or no dress code at all. So glancing at the table, what we can see is that the first category is people who want a formal dress code, next is business casual, and the last is casual or no dress code. So given that they're grouping the 31% together and the 27%, we know that that's what they mean by relaxed. So we'll just label that as relaxed. And therefore, is it correct to say that essentially none of those surveys wanted a relaxed dress code? The answer is no. In fact, 31 plus 27, that's going to be about 58%. So looking at the answer choices, that's going to be choice B because 58% is more than half, it's not fewer than a quarter, it's not all, and it's certainly not none. Question 17, at this point the writer is considering adding the following sentence based on information from the table. Only 18% preferred a more formal dress code at work. Should the writer make the addition here? So let's go back to question 16 and remember what we were talking about. Remember that we chose choice D, and so the sentence is going to read, according to a 2016 study, more than half of those surveyed want to be employed by a company with a relaxed dress code. And they define that as either a business casual dress code or a casual dress code or no dress code. And they made up the uh, 57%. So does it make sense to add this piece of information that only 18% preferred a more formal dress code? I'm going to argue yes, because if their point is that the majority of people, more than half, wanted a casual dress code, then to say that only 18% wanted a formal dress code is actually backing up their data. So let's look at the answer choices. Yes, because it provides additional evidence that supports the writer's argument. Remember, the writer prefers casual dress codes or business casual or relaxed dress codes, so A is going to work. Choice B, yes, because it refutes an opposing point of view referred to elsewhere in the paragraph. 
Does this statistic refute an opposing point of view? I don't think so. Choice C, no, because it misinterprets the information in the table. Even if you thought that it didn't belong there, it doesn't misinterpret any information because it states exactly what's there. So C is out. Choice D, no, because it provides loosely related information that interrupts the discussion in the paragraph. So it's definitely not loosely related because if they're saying the majority wants something relaxed and then you're saying only 18% want something formal, that's very closely related. So D is going to be out and the answer is A. Question 18, it says, which choice most effectively introduces the main idea of the paragraph? So what does it say right now? In addition to making companies more appealing to potential employees, dressing casually can also be a fun way to express one's individuality. So is the main idea of this paragraph about your individuality? I'm going to argue no, because if you quickly scan the paragraph, what it says is that workers dressing casually would help them most with being comfortable, being engaged, and being productive. And then it says when they actually did the casual attire, they got a positive response right over there. And there was a good level of excitement and phenomenal feedback. So this is not about individuality. This is just about like a favorable response. They're being comfortable, they're engaged, and they're productive. So A is probably not going to work. Let's read choice B. Relaxing dress codes can also help business broaden their customer bases. So nothing said about customer bases in the rest of the paragraph. Foregoing formal work attire can also result in fewer conflicts between coworkers. Again, nothing mentioned about conflicts and them being reduced by foregoing or giving up formal work attire. Choice D, instituting a flexible dress code can improve current employees morale so yeah all this is definitely a sense of morale you know your sort of motivation to work there your overall attitude so d is going to work question 19 let's start reading all the way up here when the accounting firm blah 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 asked workers what changes they would like to see in the workplace and workers said that dressing casually would help them most with being comfortable being engaged being productive said chief people officer julie wood so what you'll notice is that you've got two main parts of the sentence. When the accounting firm asks workers something, it should sound incorrect to you to put a conjunction here because from here to here, that's a dependent clause. In other words, we say something like, when they asked the workers what changes they'd like to see, comma, the workers said blah, 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 blah. So you don't need the word and here. So A is going to be out. Most likely B is going to be the right answer because it makes this the dependent clause and then the second part is the independent clause. Choice C, notice what it does is it puts a semicolon right over here. But we said with a semicolon, you need complete sentences on both sides and the first part doesn't count as an independent clause or a complete sentence. C is going to be out. Choice D is kind of weird because look what it does. It says, when the accounting firm asked workers what they wanted, comma, while workers said. So there's really no need to put another adverb in front of workers or another uh, conjunction such as while. If you want to think about this most simply, just simplify the sentence. When they asked workers what changes they wanted, comma, workers said they wanted blah, blah, blah. That's the most simple form of the sentence. And that'll help you to understand why we have to take out the word and. Question 20, we can start reading from up here because this is what we changed. Workers said that dressing casually would help them most with being comfortable, being engaged, and being productive, said Chief People Officer Julie Wood. So the question is, what kind of punctuation do we need right before introducing the quotation? Now, oftentimes we do use uh, commas to introduce quotations, but that's typically only used with speech words. So again, using my uh, Scott Forsman handbook, if you go to the section on quotations, the rule that they give on page 548 in how to use quotation marks and ellipses is that a quotation introduced or followed by the words said, remarked, observed, or a similar expression is preceded by a comma. And the example is Benjamin Disraeli observed, comma, quote, it is much easier to be critical than to be correct, 
end quote. So basically what you'll see is that the rule is if you're using a speech word to introduce a quotation, then a comma is appropriate. If, however, on the other hand, the um, quotation runs smoothly grammatically, they say that you don't need a comma. So the example that they give is Abraham Lincoln observed that, quote, in giving freedom to the slave, we assure freedom to the free, period, end quote. So what you'll notice in that sentence is that the quotation grammatically fits in with the rest of the sentence, and that's what's going on here. The workers are saying that dressing casually would help them most with blah, 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 and you don't even need the quotation marks from a grammatical perspective, but you need the quotation marks because it's their specific words. So all that means is we don't need the comma, so A is out. B is most likely the answer. Let's look at the other punctuation. Choice C, can we use a colon? Now, sometimes it is true, we can use a colon to introduce a quotation. Typically, though, the sentence before the quotation is gonna be longer, a complete sentence. And if you're using a, a colon, remember we said that there's that sense of anticipation that builds. You also wanna use a longer quotation than the one that we're looking at here. So C is like kinda okay, not as good as B, but we'll cross it off. Choice D. By putting a semicolon there, again, semicolon needs to have two complete sentences on both sides, which doesn't actually work with either of those sentences, so D is out, and the answer is going to be B. Question 21, start over here, it says, of course, formal workplace attire is appropriate and even required in some contexts, and then they give some examples. So right now the sentence looks okay, they're making the point that sometimes you actually do need formal workplace attire. So we'll keep her on A. Uh, so this is a diction question based on the answers. In other words, what is the most appropriate word? Choice B, it says formal workplace attire is admissible and required in some contexts. Admissible usually means acceptable, but in legal cases, like is evidence admissible in a court of law? So not really the best word for this situation. Workplace attire is unexceptional. Unexceptional basically means everyday, uh, nothing spectacular about it. But here what they're trying to emphasize is that you actually need workplace attire, that it's okay, it's a good thing, and sometimes it's even necessary. So it's kind of going in the wrong direction. Choice D, workplace attire is genuine and even required. So genuine means real, it means authentic, not fake. Again, really nothing to do with the fact that sometimes workplace attire is good or better and sometimes even required. So D is going to be out and A is the answer. Question 22, we're looking for the best first word. It pays to read from over here. It says, for example, job interviews and client meetings often require professional clothing. However, in certain occupations such as law enforcement, uniforms without personal embellishments are still necessary. So keep in mind the whole point of this paragraph as we just read from the previous question is that sometimes you actually need formal attire. And first they give an example of job interviews that require professional clothing. Then they give the example of law enforcement where you require professional clothing without embellishments. So. Do these two ideas contrast with each other? Do we need the word however? I don't think so, so A is going to be out. If anything, there are two ideas that kind of support each other and support the idea of the paragraph. Choice B, furthermore, does seem to work because furthermore is introduced, you know, more ideas that backing up your point. Choice C, incidentally, incidentally means, you know, you can think of it as by chance. So if two things that happen that are a coincidence, you'd say incidentally, this also happened. So it doesn't really work here. We're not talking about two events that are coincidences. Choice D, conversely, is used when you're talking about something from the reverse perspective or on the other side. So it doesn't really make sense here since these two support each other. Best answer is gonna be B. Question 23, let's start reading right over here. Many search engines collect data from users, such as their locations and search histories. They use what they gather to filter search results. So immediately you should recognize that this is a comma splice because right here starts a new independent clause or a new sentence. So let's look at how they fix it. Choice B, such as their locations and search histories and using 
what they gather to filter search results. So what you'll notice is that we use a semicolon, which could be a good solution, except the second part is not a complete sentence. You need a complete sentence on both sides of the semicolon, so that's going to be out. Choice C, such as their locations and search histories, they use what they gather to filter search results. So this is still two independent clauses, except now they're not connected by a comma, they're just connected with a blank space. So you need some kind of a conjunction or you need to split them up. So C is out, choice D, such as locations and search histories, and use what they gather to filter search results. So choice D is gonna work because what they're doing is they're turning this phrase, such as their locations and search histories, into a modifier and the main sentence becomes many search engines collect data from users and use what they've gathered to filter search results. So these are the two main verbs of the sentence and it flows better, so D is gonna be the answer. Question 24, let's start right over here. This invisible customization may create what media CEO Eli Pariser has termed a filter bubble, a biased worldview that is reinforced when it's consistently confirmed rather than challenged. So here the question is diction. Again, word choice. What is the best word to reinforce this idea that your worldview is going to be reinforced when it's confirmed rather than challenged. So reinforced basically means to be made stronger. That seems to work well because your worldview is your set of beliefs and questions and answers about the world. If it gets reinforced, it means it gets stronger. Let's see what other choices they have. Can your worldview be enlarged? Maybe in a figurative sense, uh, maybe if it means that your worldview were to become more expansive, but that's not really what they're talking about here. They're talking about how bias confirms your worldview and strengthens it rather than challenges it, so not the best choice. Can your worldview be defended? That would mean more like somebody is challenging it or attacking it and you are defending it with words or arguments, so not exactly what they're saying. Can your worldview be emphasized when it's confirmed rather than challenged? Emphasize really more means that something is drawing attention or you're drawing attention to the worldview, not as good as reinforced, which again has that idea that the biases are strengthening your original beliefs. So we're going to go with A and that's going to be the answer. Question 25, which choice most effectively combines the sentences at the underlying portion? Start over here. It is important, especially with regard to political issues, that search engines make their filtering processes explicit. When search engines make them explicit, users can be aware of potential biases when making important decisions, blah, blah, blah. We'll stop here. To simplify the sentence, we can cross off this part right here. So basically, it's saying that it's important to make these practices explicit, and when that happens, users can be more aware. So it's kind of a reason, but it's also a result of making something more explicit. So. Again, the reason that this doesn't really work so well stylistically is because you're repeating the word explicit, which generally the SAT doesn't like. So let's look at the answers. Choice A, it makes their filtering practices explicit, whereas users can be aware. So whereas is a word that's used to signal a contrast. It's not used when you're talking about one thing that leads to another, so that's not gonna work. What you'll notice is that choices B and D are wrong for the same reason. They're basically redundant. So if you say the engines make their filtering practices explicit, which has the result that, that's not as good as choice C, which basically says the same thing with fewer words. Also choice D, this is an outcome that helps ensure and then they talk about the result. So both B and D are just kind of wordy, and C gets the job better done with the simple phrase, so that. So that in this case means in order that, which implies that this thing, this result, is allowed to happen when the search engines make their practices explicit. So C is gonna be the answer. Question 26, which choice best sets up the main argument of the passage? So let's read the sentence. When search engines make them explicit, users can be aware of potential biases when making important decisions, especially when those decisions are shared with friends and family members on social media. So is 
just the sharing of those decisions with friends and family members on social media, the main idea, possibly, but there's probably a better answer. Let's read through it. Choice B, when those decisions are made based on misleading statistics found online. That's factually true, but it doesn't really get at the main idea of the passage, so that's going to be out. If anything, choice A is better. Choice C, when those decisions impact civic duties such as candidate selection and voter opinion. This seems to be more in line with where the rest of the passage is going to go because they're mostly talking about politics and then they give that experiment of the three different groups and how they perceive different political parties. So C is better than A, we'll keep that. Choice D, when those decisions have long-term effects that may not be so easy to measure. So this is really broad. It's a little bit more broad than choice C. And we're not really concerned with whether or not the effects are easy or hard to measure. So I'd say that's what really makes D wrong. So we'll go with choice C, and that's the answer. 27, start at the beginning of the paragraph. Psychologist Robert Epstein has shown how fil filtered results can lead to political biases. So this is a relatively simple sentence. He's showing how the results, that's the subject, the verb can lead to political biases. In English, there's generally no reason to ever put a comma between your subject and a verb. So A is gonna be out, C is gonna be out, B and D correct this, what's the difference? Do we need a colon right here, lead to political biases? So in the previous questions, I've said that you can use a colon to introduce an idea or a word or something when there's a sense of anticipation. Usually you do that when you have a complete sentence before the colon. So a better way to write this if you want to use a colon would be to say, psychologist Robert Epstein has shown how filtered results can lead to something unexpected, colon, political biases. The difference is that everything before the colon would be a complete sentence, and then you're saying what that unexpected thing is, which is political biases. In this case, it doesn't do that. This is actually a preposition phrase. What is it leading to? Two political biases. And so you never put a colon between a preposition and the object of that preposition. So B is going to be out, and D is the answer. Question 28, we're talking about the study. Start right over here. It says, participants whose searches favored a given candidate was 12% more likely to report a positive view of that candidate than were participants in the other groups. We can stop right here. So notice that the verb is going to be changed in terms of tense and number. So the question is, what is the subject? It's really participants. And the participants is plural, so you want to say the participants were 12% more likely to report a positive view. So C is going to be the answer. Let's look at the other choices. A is singular, so that's out B for the same reason. R is plural, but it changes the tense from past to present. So does that make sense? Would you say participants whose searches favored a given candidate are 12% more likely? Not likely because this was a study that was done in the past, and they're using past tense up here in the previous sentence. They say voters were divided into three groups, blah, blah, blah. So to be consistent with the previous sentence, we're going to go with choice C, which is past tense, and third person plural. Question 29, it says, while there's no evidence that commercial search engines intentionally skew their results in favor of certain candidates or positions, filters based on users' browser history could produce similarly slanted results. So what's going on here? You've got your main clause right over here, filters based on that, blah, blah, blah. And the first part is a subordinate clause, while there's no evidence for such and such, filters do do this thing. So right now the sentence looks okay. Let's see how they want to fix it. What you'll notice is that choices B and D add the word however. This is actually unnecessary because you already have the word while up here, which signals that there's going to be a contrast. So that would be redundant. So they're going to be out based on that. So let's look at choice C. While there's no evidence that they intentionally skew the results in favor of certain candidates or positions, filters based on users' browser history. Choice C is basically the same thing as choice A, except we're taking away the comma. And like we said before, because the first part from while up to positions is a subordinate clause because of the word while, and the second part is the main clause, 
you should separate that with a comma, otherwise it becomes confusing. So C is going to be out, and A is the answer. Question 30 is the same sentence. You can start reading here. Filters based on users' browsing histories could produce similarly slanted results. So a couple issues going on. First is, where do we put that apostrophe for users? Well, obviously, we're talking about multiple users, so it's better if the apostrophe goes after the S. That eliminates choice A. And we do need an apostrophe because the browsing history does belong to the users, so that takes out choice C. Now, the difference between B and D is whether or not histories needs a possessive. Well, there's nothing in the sentence that belongs to history, so that means B is going to be wrong. You don't have, need an apostrophe S, and D is the answer. If it had said something like filters based on users browsing history's results, then that would make sense because the results belong to histories, but that probably wouldn't be the best written sentence because stylistically it's not really necessary. You could just say the browsing histories in themselves. Question 31, this possibility is especially troubling because most users think their search engines display the full spectrum of perspectives on an issue. Question is, which choice provides the best transition from the previous paragraph to the information that follows? So is this a good transition? What is the possibility that they're talking about? It was the idea that we read before that your search history informs your search results when you look stuff up on the internet. So A seems okay. Let's see if there's anything better. B, the study therefore appears to contradict the idea that most users think their search searches display the full spectrum of perspectives on an issue. B is like, okay, it's a little bit off. The study doesn't really contradict the idea that most users think their searches display the full spectrum of perspectives. The study contradicts the idea that they actually do display the full spectrum of perspectives on an issue. Either way, it's, it's a little bit wordy, and so it's not really the best choice. Choice C, election outcomes are nevertheless unaffected since most users think their search searches display the full spectrum of perspectives. That's actually a totally different idea. The passage does not talk about that. That would be implying that just because people think there's no bias in their searches, therefore election outcomes are unaffected, also makes no sense. So C is out, choice D. Search engine designers assume that most users think their searches display the full spectrum. Again, never really talked about search engine designers and what they're thinking. Has nothing to do with what was written in the previous paragraph. So D is also out and A is going to be the best answer. Question 32, start reading right over here. It says, the vast majority of participants in Epstein's experiment, 99.3%, did not recognize the bias in their results. Politicians hope to counteract this. A 2012 survey from the Pew Research Center indicated that 66% of respondents believe that results obtained through a search engine represents all available information rather than a personalized selection. So I think the idea here is how are we going to relate these two ideas? Number one, most of them didn't recognize bias and 66% thought they got all available information. They're very similar ideas. I don't know what politicians hoping to counteract this has to do with either of these sentences. It's kind of a random piece of information. So A is going to be out, choice B, but there are mitigating factors. Mitigating factors to mitigate means to lessen. So if you're saying something's going on, mitigating factors would have the result of lessening the effect of whatever's going on. But these two ideas go hand in hand, so B is not going to work. Choice C, and this finding was by no means atypical. So choice C is okay because it goes along with these two ideas. Choice D, this was subsequently reversed. So again, there's really no reversal, no contradiction. So we're going to go with choice C as the answer. And if you were wondering about can and start a sentence, then it looks like on the SAT that they actually are okay with that. I have never seen a question up until this point in which and starting a sentence has been the focus as to whether it's right or wrong. So we'll just keep this in mind for future tests. Question 33, the writer is considering deleting the underlined phrase, adjusting the punctuation as needed. Should the phrase be kept or deleted? 
So what's going on here, if you read the beginning of the paragraph, he's basically saying that filtering is essential to search engines because of the volume of information, which is interesting because they're not saying that you should get rid of the filtering. But in the case of political information, it's important for users to be aware of the existence of filters and other factors that might bias results. If search engines publish this information, by displaying a warning that results are selected based on user preferences, for example, users would be able, better able to read political coverage online with an appropriately crit critical eye and thus base their political beliefs on a fuller range of information. So is this necessary? I think this is good information because the idea here is that we need to tell users in some way, shape, or form that their results are biased, and here he's giving a specific way to do that. So let's see what the answers say. A, kept because it introduces an additional point about filter bubbles that is developed in the paragraph. So this isn't so much a point about filter bubbles, it's more about giving users notification. It's also not really developed in the paragraph, so probably not. B, kept because it supports the passage's argument about search engines by offering a potential solution. So yeah, this is definitely a potential solution that we give warnings to users. And if the argument is that search engines and filtering is necessary, then they're offering one solution to sort of get rid of some of the negative effects, sort of lessen the negative effects. So B seems like it's okay. C, deleted because it blurs the focus of the passage by introducing information unrelated to politics. You could argue that this is information unrelated to politics. Does it blur the focus of the passage? I don't think so. And again, I'm more on the side that this is good information that should be kept. So C, I'm not going to go for because they're saying deleted and all the other reasons. D, deleted because it repeats information about search engine filters that appears earlier in the passage. So again, I don't think uh, this idea appears earlier in the passage, but more importantly, I don't think it should be deleted. So we're going to get rid of D, and B is the answer. Question 34, start at the beginning. A 2015 study led by First People's Fund, an organization dedicated to supporting indigenous artists, revealed that roughly 4 out of 10 households on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota had home businesses centered on arts or handicrafts. We can stop right over here. Notice what's going on. It says the subject of the sentence is the study. This is the study, and this is a whole modifying phrase. It says an organization dedicated to supporting indigenous artists. And what did the study do? It revealed something. So this is the subject. This is the verb. We have this modifying phrase that's describing the First Peoples Fund. It's set off by a comma in the beginning but then no punctuation right here. So basically, you just need to be consistent. That tells you that you need another comma to set it off, and so the answer is choice D. Everything else just makes it inconsistent. Here, we've got nothing by way of punctuation. Here, we have a colon. Here, we have a dash. But again, the core sentence is a 2015 study revealed that 4 out of 10 households had home businesses centered on arts. That's the basic sentence. Question 35, which choice provides the most effective transition from the previous sentence to the information that follows in this sentence? It says, however, the study also concluded that the vastness of the reservation limited local artists' ability to collaborate with one another, find mentors, and sell their art. Regardless of these discoveries, First People's Fund worked with a group of organizations and supporters to implement a plan for strengthening the creative economy of the reservation. So what are they saying? That there's a problem because of the vastness of the reservation. They couldn't work together. And then as a result, the First People's Fund worked together to strengthen the economy. So this is really an inappropriate phrase regardless of these discoveries. It's actually more like because of these discoveries, one led to another. So A is going to be out, choice B, with its headquarters in Rapid City, South Dakota. So this is just kind of random information about where they're located. It doesn't really do a great job of connecting the two sentences and showing that one thing led to another, so probably not it. C, in light of the study's results, yeah, that seems to work because that implies direct cause and effect. Because of the study's result, they started doing this. 
Choice D, founded in 1995. Again, incidental information about when, just like choice B, which talked about where. So C is going to be the best answer. Question 36, start reading here. The outcome of the organization's combined efforts have been rolling res arts, a, buzz that, a bus that would serve as blah, blah, blah. So we can stop over here. So the question is, what form should the verb be? You have to figure out what the subject is. The subject is actually outcome. Don't get confused by this preposition phrase, the outcome of the organization's combined efforts. Efforts here is actually the object of the preposition of, but because they place it between the subject and the verb, it's there to confuse you because in your mind, you're like, oh, efforts is plural, have is plural, that sounds okay. The subject is actually outcome, and outcome is singular, so that means have is wrong, were is plural, are is plural, and the only one that's singular is D, was. So just be careful that you locate the subject and you don't pick anything within prepositional phrases. Question 37, which choice best states one of the main points of the passage? Let's read it. Same sentence. The outcome of their efforts has been rolling res arts, a bus that would serve as a mobile space to support artistic collaboration and forge critical partnerships with local financial institutions. Is this the main point of the passage? I'd say no, because we didn't really talk about financial institutions. So A is not going to be it. Choice B, create new commercial opportunities for artists in the area. So yeah, that does seem to work because a lot of the passage does talk about collaboration, showing how them how they can sell their work. So B seems to work. C, provide access to computers for people who need them. Computers is definitely not the focus of the passage, so C is going to be out. Choice D, offer entrepreneurship classes for people living on the reservation. This is a very broad idea. Entrepreneurship classes has to do with starting businesses. And since the focus of this passage is more on the artists and not just business in general, D is not going to work. And so B is going to be the best answer. Question 38, which choice gives information about Montel Yu that best supports the paragraph's discussion? Rowan Res Arts itself was a collaborative work of art by Ogoa Lakota artists. Donald Montel Yu, 2014 inductee into the South Dakota Hall of Fame, was selected to give the bus a distinctive appearance. Is it relevant that he was a 2004 inductee into the South Dakota Hall of Fame? Possibly. His job was basically to design the um, picture on the side of the bus. Let's see if there's anything better. Choice B, he was a practitioner of the traditional Plains Indian art form known as ledger art. That seems to be much more relevant since that's the topic of the whole passage. C, He's an artist whose work has been featured in galleries in New Mexico, Minnesota, and Arizona. This one's okay because it adds to his credentials. Not as good as B because this is a more general sense about his accomplishments as an artist. Choice C, he's a cover illustrator for several books by Joseph M. Marshall III. So I don't really know who that is. Again, this adds to his resume, but not so much specific to the passage. So B is probably going to be the best answer. Question 39, which choice most effectively combines the sentences at the underlying portion? He created a lavish design for the bus. This design intended for the size of the bus had vivid pictograms of running buffalo inspired by the narrative scenes of ledger art. So again, stylistically not very good because it says he created a lavish design and then you're repeating the word design over here. Let's see how they want to fix it. He created a lavish design for the bus, the size of which would include Vivid running buffalo inspired pictograms suggested by the narrative scenes of ledger art. So it feels a little bit wordy. You've kind of got this add on thing over here, the size of which would do blah, blah, blah. And then you've got another one suggested here. It's okay. There's probably something better. Let's go to choice B. He created a lavish design for the size of the bus with vivid pictograms of running buffalo inspired by the narrative scenes of ledger art. This one seems a lot better than A. You get the same information here, and it's a little bit smoother because you're just incorporating the second part of the sentence into this preposition phrase with blah, 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 inspired by blah, blah, blah. Choice C. 
He created a lavish design for the bus's sides, and this design featured running buffalo in vivid pictogrammic form, suggested. So again, one problem here is you're repeating the word design, which the SAT doesn't like to do. Kind of the same problem as choice A, where you've got this last phrase suggested by the narrative scenes of Ledger R. Technically, it's a participle phrase, but it feels just like stuck on at the end, and it's a little bit of a run-on sentence. So C is going to be out. Choice D. He created a lavish design for the size of the bus in these places would be vivid pictograms of running buffalo inspired by the narrative scenes of ledger art. So this one is okay. It's a little weird to say in these places would be. So it's not as good as choice B, but other than that, grammatically, it's okay. Anyway, we will cross out choice D and go with B. Question 40, let's read right over here. After Montelieu produced drawings of the design, an Oglala Lakota graphic artist adapted them to fit the bus, helping transform its exterior into a brilliant traveling canvas. So obviously this is a question about pronouns. What is it referring to? It's obviously the bus. Now bus is singular, so that's okay. It's also an object, so you typically use it for bus and when you use its as possessive you do not need an apostrophe so this one is okay let's see if how they want to change it there is plural so it's one bus not going to work helping transform one's exterior one is a little bit vague we don't really know if it's referring to bus or something else so one is not going to work choice d his a bus is not a person so you wouldn't use a pronoun like his or hers you want to use it since technically it's an object. Question 41, start reading over here. The bus also hosts a gift shop whose manager buys works on site to sell elsewhere along the bus's travels, enhancing artists' ability to benefit financially from their art. So, so far this looks okay. This is a participle phrase. Participle is when you take a verb, make it into an adjective. What is it describing? It's describing the buying of the works. In other words, when the manager buys the works to sell elsewhere, that action enhances artists' abilities to benefit financially from their art. So as you'll notice, this is a diction question, which means word choice. So we're talking about enhancing the ability. So enhancing means, you know, make it stronger so that works. Exalting means to raise something up, to praise it. You don't really exalt someone's ability. At least that's not what they're trying to say here. Embellish means to decorate. So we're not talking about decorating their ability to benefit. We're talking about making their ability better or strengthening it. Exaggerating the ability to benefit would mean that you're talking about it in a way that goes beyond what it actually is. So not appropriate here. All that means is that enhancing your ability is the best verb for what they're trying to say. Question 42, start reading over here. Local artist and rancher Tony Richards used to have to drive more than an hour to reach a local cultural center where he sold his jewelry at the gift shop. So we can stop right over here. So really the question is, what kind of punctuation do we need around Tony Richards? The original starts off with a comma, but it's automatically wrong because if you're going to put a comma before Tony Richards, you'd need to be consistent and put one after. So A is going to be out. Notice they don't even give that option. Choice D does the same thing, but they do a comma and then a dash, which is inconsistent. So that's going to be off. Choice C has a comma afterwards, but not before. So that's off. Really what you're left with is the best choice, B, where you don't actually need a comma. What's going on here is that you've got a noun and then a noun phrase, Tony Richards. So when you've got two nouns next to each other where one noun describes the other one, in other words, Tony Richards is a rancher, it's called an appositive, and that's okay. The reason we don't really need commas is because you kind of want to know who the rancher is, so it's considered essential information. If you had set off Tony Richard with two commas, that would imply that the Tony Richards is not essential information. And that really wouldn't be appropriate in this case because we don't really know who the rancher is. So an example where you would probably use commas would be a sentence like, 
one of my friends, comma, Danny, comma, is coming over. In that sense, you don't really need to know who the friend is. You could just say one of my friends is coming over. But if you want to talk about something more specific that Danny did, you can say one of my friends, Danny, is the best artist. In that case, it would imply that the information is essential. So again, it's a little bit of a subjective call, which is kind of why I don't think they made it an issue here. In other words, they did not give you a choice E, which said rancher, comma, Tony Richards, comma, because I think that would have been a little bit too controversial. Although I have seen that question asked in other passages. Question 43, it says, while the organizations behind the project ultimately aim to open a permanent art space and gallery on the reservation to serve as a fixed cultural hub, the art in motion of Rowing Res artists will continue. So what you should notice here is that you've got your sentence which starts off with a subordinate clause, while blah blah blah. The main clause is over here. The art in motion of Rowing Res will continue. So really to connect the subordinate clause with the word while to the main clause, you just need a comma. Semicolon is not necessary because again, with a semicolon, you need two complete or two independent clauses on each side. So A is gonna be out. D is really the best answer. Notice what's going on in both B and C. In C, they're adding a conjunction, but it, does, it doesn't make sense to have the word and because you can basically say, a simple sentence, while I am tall, comma, you are short. You wouldn't say, while I am tall and you are short. While essentially enables you to connect the two without a conjunction, so C is out. And if you were to look at choice B, that would, that would have the effect of making both the, these clauses dependent and you would need an independent clause. So you can say, while I am tall and while you are short, she is right in the middle because that last part would be the main sentence. Clearly, that's not what's going on here. So B is going to be out and the answer is D. Question 44, the writer wants to incorporate a direct quotation into a conclusion that summarizes and reflects upon the main idea of the passage. Which choice best accomplishes this goal? So again, for these, you really want to pay attention to what it is they're asking for and do exactly that. So let's read what the original says. As Warren Gust Yellowhair, an artist trainer for First People's Fund said, what I do is contact some of the established artists and utilize some of their skills. So this really doesn't serve as a good summary and reflection. It's way too specific. It's part of the process of getting people together, but not a great choice. So A is out. B, Jeremy Stebb, the program manager of First People's Fund said, part of the success of Rowan Res Art depends on Quote, thinking about asset building, that is determining how to get residents comfortable with banking. So again, banking, asset building, not really the main subject here. The main subject is about how to empower the artists, help them with their art, you know, promote it and sell it. Choice C, Brandy McDonald, the former program manager of First People's Fund said, Rowing Res Arts provides access to capital and addresses other needs in the community as it passes through the space where the community resides, which is beautiful to think about. So again, I mean, I think here in terms of capital, they probably don't just mean money, they mean opportunity and networking and things like that. So this serves as a much better summary in terms of promoting artists and their work. We'll keep it around. Joyce D, Lori Perrier, the president of First People's Fund said of the founding of Rowing Res Arts, we had a conversation about doing something on wheels. So again, this is probably part of the origin story about how it happened. Doesn't really serve as a good summary and reflection upon the whole passage. In other words, the main idea of the passage. It's kind of like a, a little bit too specific. So all that means is we're gonna go with choice C and that'll be the answer.